how you'll do it. For this next book review, I'm going to talk about a series of books, well, a few books with an entire series from L. Sprague de Camp, Division Interplanetarius, also known as the Krishna series, basically because um, most of the stories that he's written for this series is um, play, takes place on the planet Krishna. But he's written books that take place in other worlds, but I'm going to focus on the Krishna books myself because that's what I have. To get an understanding about this, this is a sword and planet type story or planetary romance in the same vein as John Carter Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. And, but, I'll tell you what. Before I go into the books, um, this one had enough, this was considered a classic sci-fi, they even GURPS did a supplementary book, GURPS, that's the generic universal role-playing system, to where the concept of this role-playing game is where they have this overall system of rules and they can make any source book from, that could be fantasy, horror, science fiction, and be encompassed all into this. And this one right here is a source book that takes place right on the um, planet Krishna, created by L. Sprague de Camp. Um, let's see. Now, it, now that, I'm not going to go much about talking about role-playing games because I don't know much about the role-playing game itself. I only have this one other book, and I'll probably use that in a future um, video. But in this one I got because they took a um, um, the Krishna stories by Ellis Brady Camp, a little segment, an essay, well, or at least an introduction. He might have used this in one of his other books. But it just says the date and the month, which this takes place in 88. This book was published in 97. But this explains um, Sprague's in, um, entire idea of what he was going behind this. And I'm going to read this to you. It's on about three pages. So, I came to write the Krishna stories thus. Like many older science fiction readers and writers, I was first lured into the genre in the 1920s by Edgar Rice Burroughs' tales of adventure on Mars and Venus. Burroughs, a middle-aged Chicagoan who had a with little success, tried the occupation of cowboy, soldier, gold miner, teacher, salesman, and railroad policeman. In 1911, so, um, in 1911, read a story in a pulp magazine. He thought it was so bad that he could he could do better. So he tore off the under the moons of Mars, which he sold to All Story Weekly. Later, he published it as a hardcover book titled A Princess of Mars. The first of 11 volumes laid on, on Burroughs' version of Mars. This is not Mars, not as we know it to be, but, is, but as it ought to be. A world of boyish adventure fantasy full of exotic beasts, quasi-medieval civilizations, and beautiful imperiled princesses awaiting rescue. As a high schooler, I was right to be snared by, by Burroughs' magic. Although his Martian tales were commercially overshadowed by his Tarzan stories, which he began soon after the first Martian novel, they form a main source of subgenre imagination fiction, the Sword and Planet story. In such stories, it combined it, to combine the lure of the exotic setting with the glamour of the romanticized antiquity. The author transports his in, intrepid Earthman to another planet. There he must make his way among humanoid inhabitants, with pre-industrial civilization, without the firepower a modern expedition would command. Burroughs cared little for consistency or scientific plausibility. His Barsoom is partially based upon um, the then current theories of Percival Lowell. The eminent businessman diplomat astronomer Lowell thought that Mars, while arid, was habitable with a flat, uh, with a flat surface. He believed that the network of lines he thought he saw through a powerful telescope he built with his own money were canals dug by intelligent beings. By these canals, the civilized Martians brought water from the polar regions to the desiccated tropics. Other possible sources of burrows were the pictures of life in, on Lemuria and Atlantis and the writings of Madame Blavatsky and her theosophical followers. And perhaps a couple of nearly forgotten science fiction novels by other writers of Burroughs' time. Now it turned out that Mars was an extremely rugged surface with a volcano as wide as Missouri and twice as high as Everest. More to the point, as an abode of life, its atmosphere is not, not only lacks oxygen, but also is so thin that on Earth it would pass for a pretty good vacuum. Later, Sword and Planet authors would have taken their characters to planets of other stars. The Sword and Planet novel, putting along um, after Burroughs' younger contemporary Otis Albert Klein, published his um, obvious imitation of Burroughs. When in the late 1940s, I went. I was getting back from, um, to writing for my war, writing for my war service. 
I thought, why not write some swashbuckling, light humorous, interplanetary adventure romances of the sort later called Sword and Planet stories. But I decided my stories should be more logically thought out than their predecessors, um, without Burroughs' inconsistencies and anachronisms. Thus, Burroughs gave his Martians radium rifles, shooting 50 miles by radar sights. But the Martians still didn't, so most of their fighting with the most romantic swords. Um, on Earth, as firepower rose, hand weapons have been phased out, save for such last-ditch arms as knives. When in the 20s, I was a guest aboard a U.S. destroyer, and the ship still had a rack of cutlasses. While Barsoomians, um, Barsoomians do much fighting with swords, none uses a shield or armor. On Earth, even Stone Age people um, have made serviceable shields, helmets, and other def defenses of wood, leather, cane, reed, and coconut fiber. Burroughs Martian animals run on, on eight or ten legs apiece, for which, in that feeble gravity, they would have no need. Martians have flying machines, but surface travel involves eight-legged beasts of burden. Barsoomians are infertile, or infertile with, Earth, with Earthmen, so that John Carter begets a son and daughter on his Dejah Thoris. As any geneticist will tell you, even if the ex extraterrestrials look human and its organs were compatible, it would be easier to cross an Earthman with a geranium than an, in an E.T. Hence the stories of the Viagent Interplanetary series, beginning with the Queen of Zamba in 1949, I assume that in this 22nd century, Brazil would be leading, um, forgive me, I'm not the perfect reader. I assume that in this 27th, 22nd century, ugh, sorry. I assume that in the 22nd century, Brazil would be a leading world power. The Brazilian dominated interstellar transport system was the Viagent Interplanetarius. Um, this is pronounced Viagen, you know, he gives a pronunciation, um, and how, because of the, how you're supposed to pronounce it like a Portuguese. He does that in a lot of his writings, how to pronounce things. Krishna is assumed to be a satellite of Tau Ceti, 10.9 light years from our own Terra, with similar surface gravity and atmosphere. The intelligent species superficially resembles humans, save for leathery olfactory organs above their eyebrows, pointed ears, and greenish complexion, consulting, uh, resulting from blood based on um, hemocyanin instead of hemoglobin. Sexual intercourse between the species is possible. The resemblance is close enough for a person of one species to disguise himself or herself as the other. Relic populations exist of a less advanced species with tails. This bears much relationship to the dominant species that the population of Homo habilis or Homo erectus, if it, if it had survived, would bear, uh, would bear to Homo sapiens. The Queen of Zamba was all, has also appeared in one of its paperback incarnations as Cosmic Manhunt and in the UK as Planet Called Krishna. It tells of an insurance fraud investigator, a Canadian named Victor Hauseborg, who goes to Krishna looking for a young woman who has eloped thither with an um, adventurer in common, Anthony Felon. I had, run with some of the I had fun with the standard cliches. Thus, when Victor is condemned to fight a local predator resembling a six-legged tiger, by bribery he arranges to have the beast kept awake all night and fed a huge meal. When the yucky pads out into arena, instead of going for him, it lies down and goes to sleep. The Victor escapes into confusion. To account for the medieval weaponry, I assume that the Interplanetary Council imposes stern rules upon giving technological secrets to natives of pre-industrial planets. Because of the social breakdowns that, that result from technological change at too fast a pace, the Christians, however, suspect that their technological blockade is a plot to keep them backward so they will be more easily co conquered and exploited. Hence, they try to get around the blockade. In the story, finished, a Krishnam princeling, Farian of um, Sotasp, secretly hires a Terran to build him a paddled wheel steam steamboat. Terran officials violate their own rules to destroy the ship and, dis and preserve the blockade, but Farian soon builds another and, moreover, ordains a patent system in, in his island principality to simulate further invention. The blockade explains why Christians, although they know about Terran guns, have none and fight with swords and crossbows. At the chronological end of the series, they are just beginning to make their own muskets. The series continued through 1949 to 51, during which ten tales from short stories to novels were published in, the, in this milieu, milieu. One short, Perpetual Motion, um, is printed with, um, with the 1982 Ace edition of the Queen of Zamba.
In this tale, the con man Felix Boris goes to a knightly republic and sells the ruling group a perpetual motion engine in demonstrating which he caused in demonstrating which he causes the machine to turn by means of a concealed thread. Inevitably, he gets into trouble and flees back to Novo uh, no I don't know how to, how to pronounce that, the Terran outpost and spaceport, where he is arrested for violating the technological blockade. But he gets off by showing that his machine could not possibly work, so he was so he has not taught the Christians anything useful. Although Borel beats this rap, he appears briefly in the later novel *The Hostage of Zir*, or rather, his gilded skull appears. Most of these shorter Viagin and stories are included to the collection of content makers. Um, the second novel in the series, The Hand of Zai, or, 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 was longer than the rest of them. Hence, some of the publishers have put it um, out in two volumes, The Search for Zai and The Hand of Zai. In this tale, another Terran, Dirk um, Barnabelt, goes to Krishna looking for his employer, a provincial travel lecturer who has vanished. Barnabelt gets involved with a female-dominated Christian nation, whereas the downtrodden mills are ripe for revolt in a nearby sea containing a vast growth of weeds. Like our fabled Sargasso Sea, if you want to see their Sargasso Sea, take a ship to Bermuda, which lies in the midst of it. There is only a, an occasional patch of floating weeds. No, no impenetrable mass full of old ships running away. After 1952, I phased out the Krishna stories. For one thing, John C. W. John W. Campbell, um, whose astounding science fiction has been my best market, lost interest in um, light adventure robs and began to go off to pseudo scientific tangents, such as ESP and the, and the Dean Drive. For another, I got into other projects, which is uh, such as historical novels, the Conan stories, and my Lovecraft biography. Two, the, the two Krishna stories that I have written were not published for several years. One is a novelette, The Virgin of Zesh, which has fun with utopian back-to-nature colonies. The other was a novel, The Tower of Zenin, about a sinister cult in the, power, uh, in the tower of, uh, in question. The protagonist is the villain of the Queen of Zamba, and char charming but tricky adventurer Anthony Fallon. He was working on a he was working on a night watch in the city of Zenit and is given a job to guiding a learned but impractical Polish archaeologist to sites in the city. Fallon's nemesis is Percy Majipa, an Oxford educated um, Mangwato from Botswana in southern Africa. Percy is black, tall, lean, very strong. He is also intelligent, fearless, and high minded. But his attitude towards Christians is like that of a 19th century European colonial officer towards natives. Subsequently, Fallon, after um, going downhill to become a drunken bum, gets converted, uh, gets converted to respectability. He joins the Terran civil services and becomes a Terran consul of, um, of Majbur. In the 1983 Ace edition, Zanid is printed together um, with the Virgin of Zesh. In the 1970s, I returned to Krishna with a novel called The Hostage of Zir, featuring Borel's gilded skull. I sent, an ex I sent an inexperienced travel guide off to Krishna to manage the first gilded tour by Terrans of the most accessible parts of the world. When the story appeared as a book, the reviewers were very kind, but some complained that many Terran tourists were stereotyped stock characters. Actually, every one of those dozen characters was based on someone with whom Catherine, that was his wife, and I have encountered on such tours. For instance, a German camera fiend is based in one of, um, ugh, sorry again. And for instance, a German camera fiend um, is based on one whom we made a bus tour on the Peloponnesos in 1958. When it was time to go, he was always off in some rock taking pictures. Next came the prisoner of Zemanak. Um, with Percy Majipa, the point of view character, the officials of, of Nova Rosef, or Nova Recife, if I'm pronouncing it again. Ugh. The Terran settlement learned that Alicia Dickman, a xenologist briefly mentioned um, in the hostages' ear, has been imprisoned by the Christian ruler. Percy blows up blasted cheek if you think I'll sit on my arse while these bloody barbarians mistreat a Terran woman. You can jolly well think again. Percy goes off to Zamanak, um, intending to spring Alicia. Instead, he is disarmed and thrown in a cage that already houses Alicia. King Karosh, as a scientific experiment, 
wants to learn whether the Negroid and Caucasoid races of Terrans are in, in, interfertile. When Percy and Alicia, outraged, refuses to cooperate, Karosh has, de was, has them stripped, believing that they cannot resist sexual arousal under those conditions. Victoria P um, Poiser painted a spectacular jacket um, picture of the, of the hardback, showing Percy and Alicia looking to find inside of the cage of the ruler and his consort outside and all naked. The publisher apologized to me for the cover, but I told him I loved it. Percy and Alicia escaped with hair's breadth adventures and returned to Novor Novorosif. Again, I not seem to pronounce that right. Um, these um, there, Alicia meets Fergus Reith, the traveler guide at Hostage Zero, just back from another tour. They fall instantly in love, and the novel ends. The last of the series um, published so far is The Bones of Zora. At the opening, Fergus Reese is um, guiding a French paleontologist to the fossil bearing site on Krishna. As we soon learn, Fergus and Alicia were married for a year or so, but Alicia, though beautiful and brilliant, has her faults. First explains she should be the, she should be the greatest xenologist in the galaxy, but a xenologist should know how to be quietly inconspicuous, to blend into the background. Lish is about as inconspicuous as a sunflower in a coal scuttle. She is also bossy, dogmatic, contentious, and hot-tempered. They had quarreled bitterly because Fergus refused to let her come on their own, come on any more of his guided tours. He barred her because she always insisted on taking over. So she got, so she got a divorce and went off on her own for her sociological investigation of Katai Jorgori. As opinionated as ever, she got into trouble and had to return. Broke to no Nova Recife. I I have not yet written up her adventures on Katai Jagorai, but I may someday. I don't think he has. He died back in the late nineties. Ferguson Marot, the scientist, um, came came to the camp, uh, set up a camp at the bank of River Zora. They find that rival paleontologist Fultz is camping in the neighborhood and will and will do anything to make his particular theories of Krishna evolution prevail. Alicia is with him um, as secretary mistress. She has been forced into the job. I mean, inevitably, she and Fergus are thrown together. Alicia now misses, miserably repents ditching Fergus, but she is her own worst enemy, given to violent fits of temper. In the end, though he still loves her, Fergus refuses to take her back. She departs for Tara, for, uh, for Tara weeping. Paleontology has always been a hobby of mine since boyhood. I've written a lot about it, as, as in Catherine's and my book on the Age of Reptiles, The Day of the Dinosaur. To get some practical field experience as a um, background novel, I persuaded an old friend, Dr. Nicholas um, Houghton III, of the Natural, History, Na of the Mu Natural Museum of Natural History, to let me take part in one of the annual Permian fossil digs in Texas. With beginner's luck, the first day out, I found a fine pelicosaur, which I named Ozymandias. Round the decay of that um, colossal wreck. Um, in the story, the passage where Fergus finds an important fossil is taken from my own experience. Twenty years after the events of Zora, Alicia, having undergone psychotherapy um, to smooth out the jagged spots of her personality, returns to Krishna. She arrives as a minor executive for a motion picture company which plans to shoot a movie on Krishna. She is one of the small advance party to scout the planet for locations and arrange for hiring soldiers and other extras. Naturally, she meets Fergus, now a widower and an um, with an adolescent son. For her, only two years have, um, have elapsed because of the relativistic effects of space travel at close to the speed of light. So whereas she used to be older than Fergus, she is now younger. Fergus also has aged but little because m Medical science has tripled the present human lifespan. At Alicia's behest, the company has chosen Fergus as a guide for the advance party and for the shooting crew when he arrives. You can imagine the complications. This story has yet to be appeared, but it will probably want to, probably will will one these days. Then um, says Princess, this novel was published as a source of Zinjaban in 1991. Victoria Poiser did a splendid um, a jacket painting for this. Also. Ugh, forgive me, I can't can't seem to read it you know, perfectly as I said. Um, let's see, Victoria Poiser did a splendid jacket painting for this one also. It shows Alicia teaching a native of the planet of Osiris, resembling a man-sized dinosaur, to dance the tango. Actually, this what he described there was the um, 
um, to cover the bones of Zora, not the swords of Zinjaban. Now, let's see. The novel, Rogue Queen, is included in the Baijin story, since the organization plays a part in the tale, but it's not a Christian story, because it takes place on the planet of Ormazd. The humanoid species there consists of com um, communities organized like ants and bees. Each has a fertile queen who lays eggs, a cast of neuter, neuter female workers, and a cast of fertile males or drones who impregnate the queen but who are periodically slaughtered. An upheaval ensures that the Terran expedition lands in, in the, and the or Mazdians learn of a very different human sexual pattern. I got the idea of Kipling's short story to Mother Hive. Ellsbury to Camp, Villanova, Pennsylvania, September 1988. So, apart from my bad reading, um, sorry about that. Um, this was a pretty good introduction to what the whole series is. I may be repeating myself on this. And that's the reason why I got um, this book, uh, just, just for the essay alone. And uh, we'll go over the books I have collected in this. I'll give the whole list at the end of this video. But let's see, I'll go with this one. There's the Continent Makers. Um, this one right here is just short stories that take place. Um, while some of them do take place on Krishna, some of the stories also take place on other planets within the same universe. I've yet to read this one. Um, let's see, the other book that I have is, um, um, the, let's see, this is uh, Virgin and the Wheels, which is two stories, one involves in Krishna, the other one is one of his time travel ones. The one in Krishna is a Virgin of Zesh. It says in the back in which a beautiful woman, a mind-drunk poet, and a super sober scientist must fight for their lives on a planet occupied by weird cult occultists from the Earth and bizarre varieties of humanoids from all over the galaxy. Um, so yes, I don't think, you know, I have, again, this one I haven't read yet, but these three I have. And also on a side note, you know, and you also see this as a list at the end of the video, um, the camp has made, published all the books with a Z into it. Um, the Virgin of Zesh, the Tower of Zenid, the Bones of Zora, the Hostage of Zer, the Hostage of Zir, the, um, the Queen of Zamba, you get the idea. Now, um, this one, The Tower in the Zenith, this one, again, the essay mentions Anthony Fallon, who, who is a villain in the first, um, first novel of The Queen of Zamba. Hopefully I can find that. And he is now a guard of another city, trying to get, wanting to raise the money to get back uh, the kingdom he was trying to get since the first book. And uh, with it, as, as an officer, you know, he has his own home, he knows his way about, he's living with a Christian woman. And now, and he also on the side he gains a little extra money from selling information to this one shady character in the city. And this shady character has offered him a job to investigate the Tower of Zened, you know, right here you see on the cover here. And apparently there's some secrets that um, this guy wants to know and is willing to offer, pay, willing to pay handsomely. But Anthony didn't want, doesn't want anything to do it, you know. You know, but it, he was also asked to escort this um, archaeologist who who's very smart in being an archaeologist, but not too smart to understand how the whole world works. Kind of weird, really. So he's been given such a great offer that if he took it, he could finally have the means to um, tr um, find out what the secret is and get paid to hopefully get his kingdom that he wants back or to start a new one, however he could do it. Does he succeed? Well, that's one of the things about this, just read to find out. And then the other two, oh, um, I didn't read these in order, mind you, I just grabbed one. You have to understand, this is one of the series back then where not all stories in a series have this the exact same characters and it's all one overall plot. You have self-containing stories and short stories that take place in the world, um, which you'll have also stories in between. Like this one, I think, is like the fourth book or so, The Hostage of Zir, which, um, as in the essay that I just read, that uh, Fergus is coming to Earth. No, he comes from Earth to um, Krishna. Not know much about it, but he's starting a brand new company to do tour guides to the accessible areas. And in all, and there's always been a little bit, of, a lot of the times there's a, um, a lot of humorous moments about this. So he comes in, he doesn't know how to sword fight, so he learns what little he can in the short time he's got, learns as much of the language that he can. He's a Scotsman who has to learn Portuguese and comes to Christian, know their languages. And this is just his first time around immediately. So all hell breaks loose with not only the people that he's involved um, with in this tour guide who get into, who complain about, you know, useless things um, about 
stuff being lost and then later found. Um, one, one or two of them get um, upset the local temple for um, trying to take a or take or interact with this little um, holy relic of theirs. Uh, even um, Fergus himself ends up getting to events where he ends up getting married to a beautiful Christian woman. Um, you know, which <laughs> he has to try to escape out of that. So again, this is kind of a lot of fun stuff. It's a good, good, um, good adventure deal. And one of the sequels involving uh, Fergus again is the Bones of Zora. This is the first one I've read. And again, this is a picture that the camp was talking about that said belonged to here. This is Alicia Dickman, who was a love interest to Fergus. And this is her dancing with an Osarian. He's one of the aliens from another planet visiting, visiting Krishna himself. And I first read this, and if I have to recommend this to any paleophiles, why would they do this? Because, well, how many times do you read a fiction story where the paleontologist is a villain? Yeah, there was one that you know that Fergus is escorting to the um, to the site to pick up the bone um, to pick up this fossil, but in the way they come across um, Alicia working for the the antagonist who's also a rival paleontologist with his own theories. He wants to take the fossil found, claim it as his own, and publish his own ideas. Science kind of silly, but it is pretty much fun. I mean, yeah, I mean, again, a paleontologist as a villain is not often heard about in as far as fiction goes. I could tell you one in real life, look up Sir Richard Owen, and oh yeah. So anyway, those are the books I have. I'll put the list down below, because I haven't got them all yet. I haven't even read all the ones I've collected. But... Um, Spray the Camp is actually a very good writer, and I, unfortunately, after his death, not much of his stuff is published. Um, I've seen one reprint on the shelves of a, of a Hastings bookstore in Ponca City of um, Conan and Spider God. And, you know, bear in mind, it was also Spray the Camp who helped keep Conan alive after um, Howard's death. Um, he tried doing it in a way that wasn't all popular by the purists, you know, who loved Howard and Howard alone. But again, if it wasn't for him, you probably wouldn't have Conan today. But whatever you think about Conan, don't neglect um, the camp's other work, the Krishna series, and the whole um, uh, Vigen Interplanetarius. It's a wonderful concept, wonderful adventure stories. So yeah, part of me wants to delve back into the old classics of sci-fi and Sprague de Camp was a well-respected man from the golden age of science fiction and this Krishna series is a very good example of what made him memorable at the time and okay yeah if you know some used bookstores go to them and see if you can you know find the old paperbacks like this however it's not beyond hope you can go to Amazon or other online bookstores and you can get digital um, copies for for your e-readers so yeah give it a shot I can't seem to recommend this especially the story of Fergus uh, from the Hostage of Zir and the Bones of Zora and I hope to get the um, last one where um, uh, where him and Alicia Dickman come back together because I was kind of emotionally distraught between the two I mean I understand why they couldn't be together but usually in such um, cliche Clichés of the, of the genre of fantasy and science fiction. Men always hooks up the woman. They always reconcile the differences. Sometimes they don't. Um, so, and and it's not always dead serious with um, with the Barsoom series um, by Edgar Rice Burroughs, who started the whole thing. Um, it, it's definitely more romanticized, where you don't have to think about the exact details. And as I read from this little essay from the book of Planet Krishna, um, he tried to put more thought in how these things are actually set up. So, and again, it's just a wonderful little uh, series of adventures, and um, I, you know, yeah, just give it a shot. But I'll, list, I'll put the books down below, check them out if you really like this, and he's written other books on other planets in the same universe, so there you go. Thank you all for watching, you all have a nice day.